Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Nick Najjar of ACS Communities. But before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making my day with that review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Nick is a husband, father of four children, entrepreneur, and investor. He is a Real Producers Magazine franchise owner and is the founder of ACS Communities. ACS Communities is growing fast, and they currently manage five parks with over 270 lots located in Missouri and Illinois. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Dude, I'm so excited to have you on. I know we've been talking uh, back and forth, geez, probably for five years now. It's just pretty awesome to see your, your growth. Would love for you to share your story with all of our listeners and talk about how you got into manufactured housing. Yeah, yeah. So we were actually chatting about this a little bit offline uh, right before we started. So I, you know, have been interested in mobile home parks for literally probably about almost 15 years now. One of my one of my good friends had got the business a very long time ago, back when it, it wasn't a sexy thing. And then uh, I guess I just you just told me one of your guests, I guess will be right before me, Justin Donald has been in the space and he and I worked together at Cutco Cutlery for quite a long time. And he, you know, got in the space. So I went to the Frank and Dave boot camp, and I guess it was probably about six or seven years ago now, and was very interested. But then right after I went, like the this, this summer later, I actually started the first Real Producers, well, the fifth Real Producers magazine in all the U.S., and then, you know, kept growing that. So I kind of put a pause on my trying to find a park, and then I found a park, I think it was 2018. I was looking for about six, seven months found my first park. It was a Sunstone listing, pretty, pretty rough deal. 50% occupied South side of Chicago, real close to your park, the injury in, in Gary, Indiana. So, you know, it, it that was kind of how I first got in it. And then, you know, the, the year of COVID, we bought a park in February, <laughs> worst time ever to buy a mobile home park right before, you know, the worldwide shutdown and then bought a park later that, that June and then later than January and then just closing one in, I think, November of this 2021. So kind of slow to get in it, but now we're, we're full steam ahead. So full speed ahead. So is this your full-time gig now, or are you still working, you know, with some of the other businesses you have? It's a great question. So, I, you know, I got into this business for passive income. And uh, as we were also talking about a little bit before, this is not really a, a when you're operating, you could probably operate two or three, depending on how many park owned homes you have and depending on how heavy of a project. But it's, it's, you know, as I think most people would agree, it's not really, you know, passive. So my goal is to, you know, be the investor founder of my two companies that, that are growing very fast. You know, obviously, just just trying to be a great dad and husband is the top priority. And you know, I've I've fortunately have really great staff that are you know running the day to day of the company. So I'm just kind of high level, you know, uh, focus on acquisitions and growth and strategy that type of thing. That's awesome, man. That is fantastic. So, what year was that when you bought your first park? Was that 2019? So it was uh, December 2018. And then, ironically, the first I'm pretty sure the first time we met was at the boot. So then I'm like, okay, well, now I got to go to the boot camp because I own a park now. It was January of 2019 in Orlando. And yeah. I, it may have even been, you may have gone to both. Like you may have been at the first one and then you you were at that second one. And like this guy like gets, I was like, oh, hey, what's up? And then you had your uh, John with you and you get up and you're like talking about how your success in mobile home parks because <laughs> Frank's like, you know, talking about that. You talked about your park in Edwardsville, uh, which is, 30 minutes from my house. And, you know, it's really cool. And we, that's where we've kind of really kept yeah. in touch ever since. I just, I appreciate one, this podcast has been incredible. I mean, you, there's, there's three or four podcasts that I listen to in the mobile home park space. And this is one that's always on the list. And I appreciate everything you do for, you know, the community. You're just very uh, generous, kind, giving uh, person. It's just really cool to see you kind of grow your empire. 
So, oh man, well, I, I'm super appreciative, man, and I, I just love it. There's so much out there of of just free education that you can get. You know, with you know, Ferd's new podcast, the MHP Lawyer Podcast. There's a ton on there. The Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups. It's awesome for for people you know, that want to get in and break in, right? Because your first park is the hardest one to get. Same thing with me. Yep. It took me a year and a half to buy my first one. And then once the funnel was built, it was, it was you know, a lot more often, but. Um, yeah, and I'll throw this out there really quick, just thinking about it. I, Cause I I've probably like you, Andrew, get asked a lot, like, well, tell me about it. They get excited, you know? And I always tell them like, even if you've spent more than like three to five hours, just thinking about investing in mobile home parks, you really got to go to the mobile home university, you know, Frank Rawl, boot camp, Dave yeah. Reynolds boot camp, because it, as a passive investor, which I know this is, you know, the audience, like you're just going to be mu- a much more confident investor when you have gone through that three day training. And, you, you know, I had friends that have gone last year, like one of them's like, yeah, I'm going to buy a park. I'm going to start with a million dollar park. And then we're going to scale this. And he went to the boot camp, and he's like, yeah, I don't want to buy a park. I just want to be a passive investor. And then, you know, other guys are like, yeah, I want to get into it. So it, you know, especially for this audience, you know, even if you're not going to operate, I still recommend it because he is the best yeah. in the business and uh, it's been pretty cool to, to be a part of that. So definitely. Yeah. From an education standpoint, I've gone to four of them and I try to go every time it comes to Orlando, the MHU bootcamp, just a, a wealth of information and I mean, the networking is great. There's a lot of active operators in the room. So yeah, I love those events. Tell us, Nick, what has been the toughest hurdle for you in the mobile home park ownership business? Probably just scaling. You know, it's, it's, it's a full-time operation and, you know, you can have one or two and not have systems and staff, but as, as you grow, the, as you rack up the park owned home count and, you know, as you buy, you know, like me, some pretty heavy value add type of projects, just really creating the systems and, uh, focus on hiring the right people, like just like any business, but just, just that whole thing. Cause it's, it's a tough business to operate. Like it, there's no doubt about it. Like it's just, it, it's easy because you get the recurring revenue with a lot rent, but if you don't have, you know, say there's an 80 site park and you know 78 tenant owned homes like that's one thing but most of the deals that are coming about these days aren't aren't that so it's just kind of scaling and systems would be the the biggest biggest challenge oh yeah i definitely agree and that piggybacks on the next question of of how you manage your parks like i know you have five now you're kind of at that cusp where you're getting big enough to to start really bringing on more than just on-site managers in terms of a staff you know, tell us about that. Have you ever used third-party management or do you manage fully in-house? Yeah, never never really even considered third-party management. There was a larger community and I kind of thought about it because it was like 100 plus park-owned homes. We didn't end up moving forward on that one. Uh, but yeah, in, in-house. So one of my best friends actually for 20 years, Jason, I called him, I texted him back in November of last year. I'm like, hey man, like, cause I knew he was looking for, for a job, kind of looking to do a career change. I'm like, hey, like I'm busting the scenes, working way more than I want. Like, do you want to come, you know, help me build this thing? And he's he's all in. So that's been cool to have him as like the the key man, vice president, operator, whatever you want to uh, you know, give his official title there. So he kind of runs now the the weekly manager call. So each park, we don't have it, our largest community is 60, well, 81 sites, but it's <laughs> there's only 30 occupied. So it's a it's a big project, but our largest community is like about 65, you know, sites. So we have an on-site manager at each community, and they are just kind of eyes and ears on the ground. And then we have a operations manager, a bookkeeper, and then now Jason. So we're 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 uh, pretty well staffed. But even with the good staff, it's still, you know, when you're working with these on-site managers who are great, but they're just not it's just different than having like say one manager that, you know, they're paying them 40 or 50 grand a year. That's managing three properties or something like that. So it's a little more challenging with the onsite, but that's just kind of the way to make it work with these smaller communities. Sure. Definitely. Nick, how do you find your deals? I know we spoke offline, you know, you guys have a pretty big assignment fee uh, driven business. In addition to this, you know, what's, what's the secret sauce? Uh, secret sauce is like any sales business of, 
uh, you know, curves. I'll, I'll keep it. Uh, a lot of phone calls. <laughs> so we, you know, we use uh, auto dialer. We have two two people calling. They're not really full. You know, it's kind of hard to sit on the phone for four or five hours a day. So they're probably averaging, you know, two three hours a day, uh, just teeing up owners that want to potentially sell their park. And then we just, yeah, almost everything we do is off market. We still, you know, stay in touch with our, you know, key relationships and things like that. You know, so it's just a, a lot of phone calls, a lot of database research, a lot of <laughs> just that that off market thing is is really where we really focus. So, and is that just in Missouri and Illinois where you currently own, or where do you guys market to? So since Jason came on board, we've really started scaling, but we're basically focused on. Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa right now. And we're just kind of one one state at a time. You know, our goal is to do this in probably, you know, 30 or 40 states on a, on a pretty high level. Because I've just, the more I've been doing it, it's, it's this business is uh, like most, it's a supply and demand type of thing. And the supply is incredibly limited. And the demand is, especially at least what I've seen since COVID, like incredibly high. So as inflation rises, as people are trying to figure out what to do with their their cash, you know, this is a great opportunity for a lot of individuals, and it always has been. But it, I think the the light is now shining on this asset class. So. I agree. I agree. Maybe you could shed some more light on that. You know, what do you think? You know, the direction of mobile home parks is. You know, as we uh, move forward with the the uncertainties in the marketplace, do you think it will remain resilient like it has in previous you know recessions? Do you think there could be any any hurdles as the you know the lower you know quartile of people maybe get impacted harder than you know middle class or upper upper middle class? Yeah, man, it's a loaded question. So I think that the industry has kind of proven it's uh, recession resistant. You know, in a way, our, our our business kind of thrives in a recession. We're not really there yet, but I think everybody would say it's it's coming. It's just a matter of time. I think the only thing we might see uh, is interest rates rise. We're, we're seeing a lot of people like last year that paid some prices that if interest rates rise, they might not be able to hit that debt service coverage ratio. But I think that would you know, be a, a bad thing, obviously, for those operators, but a win for guys like you and me that would you know, then be able to buy those parks at a, a, a little more reasonable price than maybe that person paid for last year. So I think at the end of the day that, that you know, that this is if not the best, one of the best, I think self-storage kind of rivals that. And you've been getting that a little bit. So I've been intrigued by that. But in terms of, you know, incredibly low cost of living and lot rents, which will always be able to be raised and, you know, the opportunity to get really great debt on these, these assets. And, you know, I, I love, I talk about Bitcoin. A lot. I love Bitcoin. It's very simple. There's 21 million Bitcoin. There's only 44,000 parks and, the, the Bitcoin doesn't go away except for people that lose their, their keys and, and whatnot. So, but the parks are going away, unfortunately. These, these very few cities want them and a lot of bad app writers are just kind of running them, running the ground. They don't, they don't know how to manage a business and they've inherited the park from their dad or their cousin or their aunt or whatever. And they're, you know, these smaller ones are going away. There's still a ton of opportunities out there and that limited supply, high demand is, is going to have a, it's going to be a really great business for a very long time. So. Yeah. I think one of the things we were talking about this this morning on a park we have under contract is just the, the amount of forced appreciation you can bring to these things on heavy value add projects. You know, we have a park, it's in Arizona, a great market under contract right now, 50 units occupied out of a hundred units. And the current owner in his late seventies just is a typical mom and pop literally doesn't even have a rent roll. He memorized all the tenants' names. <laughs> he goes to their units to pick up, you know, rent, and, you know, usually it's cash, goes to their doors to get cash, you know, on the fifth of the month. And that's how he gets paid. So we're like, hey man, we're trying to get financing on this. We need a rent roll. He's like, all right, well, you got a pen? I'll just start <laughs> shooting it off to you. Seriously, swear to you. He said, yeah. you have a pen. And he, he was going to tell us all the tenants' names, you know, the lot number and how much they pay every month. So- I think that aspect of mobile home parks makes it a great opportunity. And it will, while a lot of these baby boomers over the next 10 years are retiring and, you know, giving these assets, like you said, either to their children or to, 
you know, family members or they're selling them, right? They're letting them go. I think it's a great opportunity for a new generation to come in and maximize these things. And that's what, you know, people like operators like you and I are doing, you know, adding yeah, value. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of other thoughts on that, just because, you know, I know this group of past investors. So the, the, the benefits of just real estate in general, but our business, you know, doing a, a cost segregation and doing, getting the bonus depreciation. And one of my friends that's been in the business for a long time, I think he has like 11 or 12 communities now, and he's, he's bought and sold quite a bit over the years. And he's like, Nick, if I, if I actually understood the asset appreciation, I probably would have bought a lot more. It's just the, the ability to, you know, appreciate the asset, get depreciation, raise rents, boost your net operating income, you know, refinance the property, take that money out and repurpose that however you want. It's just a really, really beautiful business. So, yeah, very tax efficient for sure. Tell yeah. us this, Nick. This is one of the most important questions I ask everybody that, that comes on the show. What are the most important things that passive investors, you know, we're talking LPs here, what do they need to look out for when they're investing into mobile home parks with? different operators or funds? Oh, that's a great question. So I, you know, I listen to your podcast a lot. It comes up a lot. Obviously it's all about the operator, right? You know, if, how is that operator full time? If, if they're not like somebody like me, like, well, we have a, you know, three soon to be four full-time employees that are running, you know, the day-to-day of the business. So just the track record, obviously. And I think, I think there's opportunities too, to, if you're a passive investor, you know, help out the newer guy, right? Maybe they're looking for their first park. As long as the, the terms are favorable, you know, it still can be a great opportunity and a great way to for somebody to get their feet wet as a passive investor and also to help the, the new guy start his his kind of business. So uh, the track record, you know, the pro formas, I, I, you know, now I know what, you know, I, you look at a lot of broker pro formas and they're very, inflated, you know, and even some of these individual, I've been looking at more passive opportunities. So I'm trying to get on, you know, what I would consider, you know, better operators uh, lists for, you know, passive investments. And I still see some of these pro formas. I'm like, yeah, I don't think you're going to be able to bring in, you know, 15 homes next year or raise rents this much. So just really paying attention. This is where, you know, the boot camp would come in handy or just finding you know, a mentor that, that knows the business before you make that investment to just run it by them to say, hey, does, do these numbers make sense? Is this cash on cash return really going to be, you know, 16% as a passive investor, or is it going to look more like eight? You know, there's, there's some horror stories. I'm in the Justin Donald's investor group. And, you know, there's a, a fund out there that a lot of guys invested in three years ago, and they haven't got anything in three years. It's just like, mm. man, you know, so it, you know, just gotta, you gotta do your own due diligence. You can't rely on their due diligence. You know, if you're going to be a past investor, go, go drive the property, drive the asset, see, you know, get your eyes and, you know, on that, that area and really look at the real estate and ask yourself the right questions. Like, would you own this? Obviously you might not want to operate it, but is it attractive? Is it, is it, is it sexy? Or if it's not sexy today, what does that, you know, what does it look like a year or two from now when, when somebody, can't turn that thing around. Yeah, I, I think uh, that you made some really good points there. And I think like on the deals that I started out with, and, and we still do so, several of them, and the deals that you're doing, Nick, that are more value add, you know, forced appreciation, bringing in homes to fill vacant lots, you know, improving management. I think on those types of deals, I actually, you know, pending good due diligence, right? I actually feel more comfortable with the the more value that there is to be added, right? Because there's such a cushion. And with a pro forma, I tell this to our investors too, like how wrong is this going to be? Like that's what you need to look at, <laughs> right? Because every single pro forma we've ever prepared has gone off in one way or the other. And it's it's really, do you trust the operator? Do they have experience doing what they're saying they're going to do? But yeah, I, I agree. You know, being able to, add value to communities through bringing in homes and so forth. I, I just love it. it it's just, it, it adds so much value and, you know, not a lot of people can do it like you and I can. So that's, that's huge. Let's ask this. What does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes and why? Completely occupied with tenant owned homes, city water, city sewer, low lot rents that can be raised over time uh, and is as big as possible. So simple. That's, that's direct right. bill 
ideally, right? <laughs> oh yeah, direct direct bill water sewer is is huge. We have a direct bill water, it's not direct bill sewer, and it, we have another one under contract that's direct bill water, and it's small. It's twenty two sites. I'm like, oh, it's direct bill water. That's great. Yeah. Like, let's do it. You know? It's so <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah. That's that's huge. And you know, to buy that park you just described at a 10 cap, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that'd be great. Nick, what are some mistakes that you guys have made uh that maybe we could learn from? Yeah, so man, so many, right? But you don't know what you don't know, you know, and that's one of the things I love about listening to podcasts and learning is to try and mitigate and learn from other people's mistakes. So uh HUD, I I think I actually talked about some birds. So I'm gonna I can't remember which mistakes I, I made a list of like five. So I'll try and think of new ones, but but I didn't really realize what HUD was. So we go, we literally order new homes. We order three new homes, like, oh, we'll put it on these two vacant lots and we'll put one lot here. And then the the installer comes out and he's like, oh, Nick, that's not going to pass like the HUD inspection. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and yeah, I learned this whole thing about HUD, right? So, you know, I just missed that in boot camp somehow, you know? So that was a big one. Just you know, the frost six inch frost, it depends on the state, obviously, right? The mm -hmm. six inch frost free foundation and the, you know, concrete slabs. And if you're going to do peers, you know, what all that, that whole thing was like, quite the yeah. learning experience. Uh, <laughs> you're not the only one. There was a oh, huge, yeah. there was a huge group actually recently that just bought a ton of parks and on their pro forma, they didn't account for concrete work. And that is so, so important when you're planning oh, yeah. on bringing in into HUD states, because like you said, you know, when, when we bought that park or we bought the, the several in LaSalle County, you know, mm -hmm. just West of Chicago, we had to go 48 inches deep on the concrete, <laughs> like 48 <laughs> inches. And you had to have, you know, I think it was 24 piers, you know, 24 inches in diameter per home. So you know, that's, that was like five grand per lot in concrete oh, yeah. work. So you, you definitely you got to account for, for all those costs. Yeah. And it depends on the mark. So our concrete work was like, I think it was like a 10 or 11,000 for locks is in, in the Chicago Metro, right? Like just oh, wow. caught everything. Lot rents are incredibly high. You know, I think we're getting like 600 bucks a month right now, but everything else is pretty expensive. So, uh, and yeah, and even a little, little tip, I always, this was the pro form I looked at, you know, these, when you get these older homes, you know, 60s, 70s homes, you see a lot of parks that have them. I'll just start budgeting like 15 to 20 grand per home because it's like, okay, well, we can completely remodel it, probably come in less than 15 mm -hmm. to 20, or we can tear it out, put in a new home, like prep the new pad, and it's probably going to, you know, come out there. So it's, it's kind of worked for me. So I, I'd love your opinion. Like, do you think that's a good way to kind of look at, look at those the older homes? lots and vacant lots? Yeah. Yeah. I try to get, you know, pretty specific with it where I'm like, all right, I'm going to charge three grand to tear this, this home out of here. And then I'm going to, you know, put in new concrete if I'm going to bring in new homes. Uh, but we, we go with 18,000 to bring in a used home. And then for the new homes, we've been using legacy a lot. Have you gotten homes from them or what? I've, I've heard of them. I looked into it. We use 21st uh, for okay. the new homes. We actually haven't ordered. I need to order some. We just put everything on hold in COVID. And now it's like, mm -hmm. all right, we probably need to do this. But they're like, oh, yeah, we'll get it to you, you know, fall of 2023. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just it crazy, crazy times right now. So, uh, but yeah, I'm familiar with legacy. If you want to explain, uh, go ahead. Yeah, legacy, program. they have I mean, like a, a financing arm you know, so you can, you can come in and I think put down like five or 10% of the, the cost of the new home plus transport and they'll finance the transport and the, the new home. So, you know, for being able to fill a lot for maybe, you know, 15 grand, that's a new home, you know, is, is pretty, you know, pretty attractive. It, it has to be the right market though, you know, that you can get yeah. high enough lot rents like that one you just mentioned where you got 600 a month lot rents. I mean, that's, that's awesome. You know, you should, that would, that would be a park that I would look at more new homes, but then we have other parks that have lot rents around 225 a month and they're just a more, you know, more rural area. So I would, I would look at used homes in that type of market for sure. That was a big uh, lesson learned for me too, is, you know, we moved in some homes trying to sell them, but it's really a renter's market. So it all worked out because we're getting, I think 1100 a month and, and, you know, a lot wow. home rent because it's in Chicago, but it's, it's, uh, that was a, you know, big lesson learned as well. So Definitely. know the market. 
Know the market. Know the market. One. Yeah, for sure. Tell me about some of your value add projects. You know, I know you've taken on some some heavier lifts. What's been some of the hardest parts uh, of value add? Is it infill? I know a lot of people stress that. Is it rehabs? Is, you know, what is the all all of it's hard. I don't know what else to say, but I think, uh, you know, the one actually, uh, props to Corey Woodruff. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's actually funny. So, uh, I, I could like write a book on the deals that Andrew passed on. We actually, two of the communities in, in Granite city, Illinois, Andrew, like you, you looked at, I think, I think I've got them at a much better price than you passed on. Cause it was like, you would look at it. And then like six months later we, we came in. So like this owners kind of got beat up a little bit in that process. Um, but anyway, Corey, Corey, <laughs> I think you actually, I, I appreciate, I think you were the one that introduced me and I, I appreciate that a ton because I think you sent, I had asked you like, Hey, do you know, if, I asked you if you wanted to sell your community in the St. Louis Metro area in Illside. Yeah. And you're like, no, but check out this park. And it was, it's rough. 81 sites, 30 occupied homes, 14 abandoned park on homes, like straight up abandoned, complete owner neglect for a decade, right? Yeah. Like that is a, a rough project. And the the, the, heart, the biggest hurdle, I think for almost everybody in the industry right now is just contractors, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll get, we'll go through like three contractors just to finish a home because like they'll start, they'll do good work for like two weeks and then they'll disappear. <laughs> and it's just yeah. like this, this vicious cycle of, uh, you know, trying to, stay within budget on these homes. And, and fortunately we've been able to, to do that. Uh, but that's a big one. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. That's... Yeah, no, I would, you know, with the contractors, I'm stressing to all of our project managers every day, you know, don't get, uh, don't get ahead on pay and behind on work, you know, because as mm -hmm. soon as you do that, you know, the, the chuck in a truck handyman type, you know, they just take a couple of weeks off, you know, when they, when they get ahead. So uh, it, it is tough. And I think that's one of the big differences, right, between mobile home parks and, you know, other asset classes is that, you know, we're not able to really get a general contractor to come in and rehab these homes, no matter if we have 20 or 30 that need to be rehabbed, right, the mobile homes, you know, a, a general contractor has bigger jobs with, you know, uh, just just better margins than mobile home rehabs. So we're forced to use more handyman types and you know, just, just trying to get a handyman that has insurance uh, is a challenge in and of itself. So uh, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. You know, you just, if the more experience you have, the better you get, I think. Yeah. I think this business, it takes that, that grit. You just got to keep following up and following through and you got to have kind of thick skin, right. To deal with the, yeah. the issues that, that are uh, issues. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a, a complex business, right? Uh, there's only a certain number of levers, but uh, you definitely need that grit, that that hustle to really, you know, see things through the finish line. Because, you know, for example, we have one transporter that is the most like laid back guy, like he, he's, he's older. Uh, but if we don't follow up with him three or four times, that home's not going to get delivered. Like we have to get him off the couch to get him in the truck, <laughs> to get him working. And we do, we do, you know, so we've that's, done some creative great. things to get him, get him working, but just, just curious, a few, few quick questions for you. So what are, you mentioned levers, what are, what are your key levers uh, that you look at on a weekly, daily, monthly? What, what do you, yeah, great, what are your KPIs? Great question. So for us, our KPIs, I mean, we have, they've, they've grown, like we have like a whole list of them, but definitely occupancy is our queen bee role. Not sure if you, uh, you know, have, have looked at uh, clockwork, the book clockwork. Highly recommend that book. Great book. Yeah. 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 So we like have occupancy hats and stickers and everything all around the office. So we're always talking about occupancy. Um, so we're looking at that compared to what our pro forma occupancy was. Uh, we look at collections, obviously. Uh, which collections usually average out to about 95, 96%. So if we got heads and beds, we know we're going to collect 95% of the rent. So, you know, collections is on there. Uh, we look at um, NOI versus pro forma NOI, you know, what we thought it was going to be versus actual. Um, and then expense ratio, you know, what our expenses are uh, is, is super important for us. One, one hidden one that I think is uber important is the CapEx, you know, the unexpected CapEx, right? Like someone that was a tenant owned home when you bought the park, 
they, you know, trashed the place and they've been living there for a long time. And, you know, you don't really budget to, to have to rehab that home and, you know, maybe tear the home down when they move out. So we always keep track of that and look at the turnover rate because that's something that, you know, we look at, you know, honestly, when we go to sell a park, right? Like the parks that we sell, you know, if they have high turnover, that is a key indicator that, Hey, this is not, we need to exit this park and find other parks that have lower turnover. So yeah, those are a few. Love it. Let me ask you this, Nick, uh, what is the value proposition at ACS communities? You know, what would you say makes you guys different uh, for investors out there looking to invest with you guys? You know, we, we just run it like a business. So, you know, you mentioned clockwork, I, you know, building an elite organization is a great book. Don Wenner, uh, DLP lending, really cool company, very cool success story. And I, I just like uh, that, that model. So, you know, we're just, we're just, you know, who has some really great systems that we've been working on and, you know, pay attention to all the levers on a very consistent basis. And, you know, just uh, think that we have the experience to, you know, go out and really tackle any project and, and you know, get our investors a, a great return. So. Love it. Love it. Nick, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they would like to do so? Probably our, our sales arm of our website. It's uh, elephantcp.com. So Elephant Capital Partners, uh, Elephant, like the, the elephant with us, uh, CP, capitalpartners.com, uh, elephantcp.com. Awesome, dude. Tell us one last tip for passive investors uh, interested in investing in mobile home parks. What, what's one last tip before we let you go? I kind of already covered it. Just, just do your due diligence, you know, don't rely on a pro forma or, you know, anything that the investor tells you, do your background on the person, run a background check, run a, ask, ask for a list of their investors to get their opinion on how have the returns been. And, and, you know, just, just really do your diligence, get an attorney. If you if it's a PPM or a fund, you know, review all the details, know what you're getting into. That's uh, like any investment. It's all an alternative investment. You really just want to do your property diligence. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Nick. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for everything you do. Awesome. That's it for today, folks. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Would you like to see mobile home park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.